Hi, and welcome again to my Physics Online Video Lecture Supplement Series. In today's video, I'm going to begin lecture set on DC circuits. So what is a DC circuit? Um, a DC circuit, DC stands for direct current. Uh, these are relatively simple circuits. It means that the current is not alternating in polarity as it's delivered to the device. Very often that means it's drawing from a simple source like a battery. And these circuits commonly might contain, for example, the power supply, a battery of some sort, and then a set of resistors and a set of capacitors. Many of the household circuits which we use in our everyday life, and, and this might be extended to include stuff like flashlights or MP3 players, can be understood in terms of simple DC circuit theory. And the main laws that govern these circuits beyond Ohm's law would be Kirchhoff's laws. So what I have over here is a diagram that I pulled from, I believe, Giancali. You can see in the credits at the end what my source was. I think this one's Giancali's text. And what he shows is an MP3 player. Looks like one of the Apple players. And basically, you have an iPod, and here is the circuit that basically governs this iPod. And if you look at what this circuit has in it, it's largely a bunch of capacitors and a bunch of resistors, which we know how to use. There is something for the headset speaker driver, which we discuss in part two of this lecture set anyway. And really the only other element that's exotic that we don't deal with in this introductory course is this triangle which represents basically a, an op amp. So in the first part of this lecture set I'm going to end up discussing DC circuits as such. In the second part I'm going to maybe use talk about a few simple applications of DC circuits. We begin this lecture set then with direct current or DC circuits. And these generally have a constant voltage. Certainly the, the main requirement is that the voltage polarity remains constant. That means that you're hooked up to something like a battery. This terminal is always positive. This terminal is always negative. You can contrast that with what's called an alternating current or an AC current, which is what you get out of the wall outlet in which the polarity actually flips. And so that is like switching this from a plus to a minus and this from a minus to plus and then switching them back and so on in time. Usually with a DC circuit, we're hooked up to an actual battery like this. This terminal is positive, this terminal is negative. It doesn't change. The voltage remains basically constant in time, although of course, a battery eventually dies. That implies that it loses charge, and in fact, it does lose voltage over time. But we can assume for short periods of time, say minutes or hours or what have you, depending upon your application, that a battery is effectively a constant source of what's going to be called EMF. And if it's hooked up to a single circuit, and nothing is changing in the circuit, basically it's going to act as a constant voltage source. So Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's law are what we're going to be using to determine current and voltage drop and so on throughout the circuit. We're going to look in this part about how you can combine resistors in series or parallel. I've already actually talked about that in the context of combining uh, capacitors in series or parallel. So here is a pair of uh, effectively resistors in series. Here they are in parallel. Eventually I'm also going to talk about 
combining resistors and capacitors, although that's almost more a topic for part two of this lecture set. The first topic of, of real interest in discussing DC circuits is what's called EMF, or electromotive force. I mentioned it just a moment ago when I said that a battery basically has a constant EMF. So EMF, we, we use a small epsilon to represent it. It does stand for electromotive force, but it's worth noting here, EMF is not actually a force, so this is a misnomer. Rather, what EMF is, is basically the work done per unit charge. So it is kind of similar to a voltage, although it is not the same as the terminal voltage. We'll look at that in another slide, what the difference is. It can be related, however, to the terminal voltage drop. The EMF for a battery is always greater than or equal to the terminal voltage. If there is no current flowing through a circuit from the battery, then the EMF is in fact equal to the voltage drop. So the EMF is basically the maximum possible voltage drop for the terminal for a battery. If you connect the battery to a load, that is if you hook up a circuit to the battery, then the voltage drop will be less than the EMF. And what the EMF basically is, is it's a charge pump, which, which, and here's where force comes in. It does force electrons to do something. It forces electrons to move in a particular direction. But again, the units for EMF are actually volts, just like with potential difference, not newtons like with a force. So how is it that we get from EMF to voltage or vice versa? Well, a battery itself is going to have some internal resistance. So here we have a diagram that shows a battery and the battery is passed through some load, basically a resistor. And this is the equivalent circuit diagram for this battery connected to this load. The battery terminal is usually represented, or the battery itself is usually represented by using the small thick line and the longer thin line that are parallel to each other. So this is the, pl the uh, positive or plus terminal, this is the negative or minus terminal, but there is some internal resistance little r in the battery and that has to be placed in series with everything else. So we have little r and then from there there's a current drawn by the load the load has a total resistance of big r and as we'll see in a little bit when you have resistors in series the resistances combine by simple addition so the total resistance for this is equivalent to having a an ideal battery which has delta v equal to emf but with a resistance of little r plus big R. So the potential difference for the two terminals is going to be given by the EMF minus the current times the internal resistance. So remember that current times resistance is basically a voltage or a voltage drop if you will. So that's giving what the voltage drop across this internal resistance is. That's how much voltage drop we have before we get out of the battery. And then what's left of the voltage can be dropped across the load. So delta V, the actual terminal voltage, is the current times the load resistance. And so the total EMF we can write as I times R plus I times little r. And you can therefore solve for the current by saying that the current is the EMF divided by the sum of the load resistance and the internal resistance. So once you have the current, you can then go back and figure out what the voltage drop is through the internal resistance of the battery 
and you can figure out what the terminal voltage is or what the voltage drop across the load is. It's the same thing. Furthermore, we can relate all of this to ohmic power. Remember that ohmic power is given by current times voltage drop or times potential difference. So the actual power output from a battery is going to be current times EMF. And using that equation from the previous slide, this basically means that you have current times, uh, if you flip up one slide, current is epsilon over R plus R. So if you rearrange back to I times R plus I times little r, you're multiplying this by another I for current, and so you get I squared big R plus I squared little r. So that's how much power is being put out by this battery between the internal resistance and the load resistance. Most batteries have a very small internal resistance. And we're going to do an example that looks at this on the next slide. So typically, the internal resistance is going to be much smaller than the load resistance. And so we can basically neglect the internal resistance when determining the current. Of course, in an ideal battery, the internal resistance is zero, but a real battery is not the same as an ideal battery. It always has some slightly larger than zero internal resistance. That, by the way, is the reason why a battery heats up when it's used for a long time, is because there is some current moving through this resistor. That means that you have some power being lost for the battery. The power is going is being converted from electrical energy into basically heat, which then gets radiated through the battery, hence making the battery hot. So what a battery actually is, is not a constant voltage source, but rather a constant EMF source. Here are the examples which I promised. So let's work through these each in turn. Okay, first example, we want to know what is the terminal voltage. So the terminal voltage, we could represent as delta V, of a battery whose EMF, that would be epsilon, is 9.0 volts and has an internal resistance of 1.0 ohm, that would be little r. And we're doing this connected to three different loads. Ra is 5. RB is 50 and RC is 500 ohms. So how do you get the terminal voltage? Well, the terminal voltage is the current times the resistance in each case. And the current was given by the EMF divided by the sum of the load and the internal resistances. So it's going to be this times the resistance in all three cases. So for case A, we have delta V is 9.0 volts divided by 5.0 uh, ohms, 5.00 ohms, plus 1.00 ohm, because that's what the internal resistance is. And then that's going to be multiplied by 5.00 ohms. Note, by the way, that we could rearrange this to sh say that the voltage is the EMF times the load resistance over the sum of the load and the internal resistances. That might be a more natural combination because we've got resistance over resistance, so you can see that you're going to have this times the ratio. In any case, this right here is 9 times 5 divided by 6. So that gives us a total voltage of 7.5 volts. So we start off with 7.50 volts. Obviously, this is a significant amount less than the EMF of 9.0 volts. For part B, we have delta V 
is 9.0 volts times 50.0 ohms divided by 50.0 ohms plus 1.00 ohm. So now we have 9 times 50 over 51. This gives us about 8.82 volts. So for voltage uh, A, we had 7.5. For voltage B, we have 8.82 volts. Okay, this is very obviously a lot closer to that 9.0 volt uh, ideal EMF. In fact, this is at this point 98% of the EMF. So we're pretty good at this point as far as approximating the battery as having the same voltage as the EMF listing. Delta V sub C becomes 9.0 volts times the R sub C, which is 500 ohms. I'm taking this, by the way, to be 5.00 times 10 squared. So these are both significant zeros in this case. And that's plus 1.00 ohms. So now we have uh, 9 times 500 divided by 501, which gives us about 8.98 volts. So 8.98 volts. Within the number of significant figures that we have, there's still some difference. But at this point, we're getting pretty close to about 99.8-ish percent. So if you were to divide that number by 9, you'd get 99.8004. So at this point, we might as well say that the battery voltage is equal to the EMF. We're about two orders of magnitude larger for the resistor on the load than on the internal resistance. In fact, we're very close to three orders of magnitude difference. A continuation of that previous example is to ask what is the current of the battery that we just worked through for each of these three cases. So I've copied over the voltages, the terminal voltages that we found, along with the resistances of the batteries in question. So the terminal voltage was delta V should be I times R. So for case A, uh, by the way, we should probably solve this. I is equal to delta V over R. So case A, we have I is delta VA, 7.50 volts, divided by RA, 5.00 ohms. So this is, in fact, 1.5 amps. Case B, we have... I is equal to 8.82 volts divided by 50.0 ohms. So this gives us 0 0.1764 uh, amps. Sorry, this should be amps, not ohms. Case C says that I is nine, uh, excuse me, 8.98 volts divided by 500 ohms. So that is going to give us about 0 0.01796. Uh, so that would be 0 0.180 amps. And to con Continue this example a little further. What is the power output of the battery in each of these cases? So again, I've copied over all of the relevant information about current, resistance, and voltage from the terminal for each of these battery cases. Remember again that the EMF was E equals 9.0 volts, same for all three cases. So which of these terms do we actually need in order to get the power? Well, 
we could use the resistance because recall that we also have the internal resistance 1.00 ohm and that the power can be found by using I squared times R plus R. However, I would rather do a slightly simpler calculation, which is that the power should be I times epsilon. So this means that for case A, the power is going to be 1.5 amps times 9.0 volts, which is going to give us a total of 13 Point five, or if we're rounding off to two significant figures, it's going to give us 14 watts. Case B, the power is going to be 0 0.176 amps times 9.0 volts. So that is going to give us approximate 1.548. So we'll call that 1.6 watts. And in case C, the power is 0 0.0180 amps times 9.0 volts. So that is going to give us approximately 0 0.16164. So this would be about 0 0.16 watts. What is this last set of quantities telling us the power outputs. Well, among other things, it's going to tell us how quickly this battery is going to be drained of charge. So how how long is it going to be till we run out of charge on the battery, until the battery is dead, in other words. The more power drain you have, the faster the battery is going to run out of charge, because the battery basically comes with a set amount of charge and a set voltage. In other words, a set energy. So recall that energy is, or work is, going to be power times time. And this right here is sort of fixed for the battery, or constant, or it's set when you buy the battery uh, based on what the voltage is, or based on what the EMF is, I should say, and based on what the charge of the battery is. So this one right here is going to drain the battery almost 10 times faster than this load, which is going to drain it even closer to 10 times as fast as this load. So if you can have this load attached to the battery, and this lasts for, say, an hour, then this load right here is going to last for a little less than a minute, uh, excuse me, a little over six minutes, roughly, about six minutes, and this one is going to be a little less than a minute, something like maybe 36 seconds, in fact. Uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, because it's not exactly ten times this and ten times this. Earlier I stated that if you have a couple of resistors which are in series with each other, you can just add the resistances together to get the total resistance, and that's how we analyzed the battery with an internal resistance that was hooked up to a load resistance. So let's be a little more explicit here on why that is. We're going to connect two or more resistors in series, that is they're connected sort of end to end. So that's like connecting a resistor and then attaching another resistor to it and then attaching another resistor to it and then putting the lead of the first resistor on one terminal and the lead of the other resistor on the other terminal of the battery so that a charge uh, carrier moving from the positive to the negative terminal must pass through each resistor in turn. What this means is that because we have conservation of charge a charge that starts here has to end here, and a charge that starts here and moves around the other way has to end here, the negative charge of the electrons. And what that means is that the current passing through each of these resistors must be the same as the current in all the other resistors. So they all have the same current I. 
This means that we can now use Ohm's law across each individual resistor to figure out what the voltage drop is. Delta V sub I is the voltage drop across a given resistor, and that is the current through that resistor times the resistance of that resistor. And since the current is the same for all three, we can just write this as I R sub I. So the voltage drop here is I times R1, here it's I times R2, here it's I times R3. You'll recall that conservation of energy requires that the voltage drop across this plus the voltage drop across this plus the voltage drop across this must be equivalent to the voltage drop across the battery that's supplying these. In fact, one of the rules that we're going to learn is that the sum of all four of these voltage drops must be zero. So V1 plus V2 plus V3 is actually equal to negative V, where V is the voltage drop across the battery itself. As with capacitors, and for that matter, as with springs, we can, in fact, try to figure out what the total uh, voltage drop is going to be and what the total current through a equivalent an equivalent resistor to this combination and so we can find what the equivalent resistance of the combination is so the total voltage drop is the sum of the current times the resistance for each resistor i sub i r sub i so i1 R1 plus I2 R2 plus I3 R3. Since the current is the same through all of these, that means that A, we have this equivalent resistor that we can treat as being similar to these, and B, it's got to have the same current and the same voltage drop and the same power used as this combination does. And since the current is the same through all of these, we can basically write that this sum, we have uh, I times R plus I times R plus I times R. We basically can remove the I and put all the R's in parentheses. So delta V is current times the collective sum of these three resistances. Because Ohm's law is applicable both to this series of resistors and to this individual equivalent resistor. We can write two different equations. One says that delta V, the total voltage, is the current I times the sum of the resistances. The other equation says that delta V is I times R equivalent, or RS for series. So the voltage drop in both cases has to be the same. It's the voltage, terminal voltage of this battery. So this voltage drop can be set equal to itself and therefore the right hand sides of the equation can be set equal to each other. And so the I times R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus dot 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 is equal to I times R equivalent. And so the equivalent resistance of the series of resistors must be R equivalent series equals sum of R sub I's, which is R1 plus R2 plus R3. So here is the take home point of this particular set of slides, the main equation of importance. Having found what this equivalent resistance is, we then can actually go back because we know what the voltage is here, the voltage drop. We can then go back and figure out what is the actual numerical value of the current. And once we have that, or even without that, because we can use V squared over R for the power, we can find what the power consumption of this circuit is. Okay, let us now consider a set of resistors placed not in series but in parallel. So here we have the diagram which shows first of all the circuit diagram for that. Here is your battery, here are your three loads, they are in parallel. There's junction A, there's junction B. 
Second of all, here's the battery and here's three actual loads. So this might actually look like what the circuit is like roughly in real life, if real life were a cartoon. And then third of all, here's what it looks like if we replace all three of these with an equivalent resistor for this parallel combination. So we're going to use the same two principles that we used in the previous discussion of resistors in series. Those two principles are that charge must be conserved and energy must be conserved. Conservation of charge says that the amount of charge that enters junction A must equal the amount of charge leaving junction A and that these charges then get recombined at junction B and so that must equal whatever charge you started with. Since current is charge over time and since time isn't something that's really at issue here, this basically means that the current going in has to equal the current coming out. This, by the way, is going to be one of Kirchhoff's laws. So that means that I1 plus I2 plus I3, that's the currents leaving junction A through each of these three branches, must be equal to I. And in fact, I1 plus I2 plus I3 will recombine at junction B and be equal again to I. So this is the charge conservation. The second rule is that we also have to have energy conservation. And energy conservation says that for each resistor, we have delta V is I sub I times R sub I. That's Ohm's law. Uh, energy conservation then takes that and says, now the total voltage for each one of these resistors must be the same since they're in parallel. Because for any possible loop that you can go around, and this is the other of Kirchhoff's laws that we're going to learn later, for any possible branch or complete closed loop that you can go around, the total voltage drop must be zero. So one closed loop would be like this. That's going around the circuit one time, so R3 must have the same voltage drop across it as delta V, albeit in the opposite direction. Ditto for going through like this, so R2 must have the same voltage drop across it as the battery, albeit with the opposite sign, and similarly for R1. So this basically is saying that delta VI uh, is equal to delta V, albeit with a negative sign inserted. And so delta V1 is equal to delta V2 is equal, is equal to delta V3 is equal to negative V. So that is the two principles we're using. If you combine conservation of energy with Ohm's law, what you end up getting is that the current, which is equal to I1 plus I2 plus I3, must be equal to delta V1 over R1 plus delta V2 over R2 plus delta V3 over R3. We're combining here conservation of energy, conservation of charge, and Ohm's law. Conservation of energy has implied that this is so. And we notice that the numerator is the same in all three of these cases, delta V, delta V, delta V. The equivalent resistance must obey all these same laws. So for the equivalent resistance, you get delta V over delta R equivalent in parallel. And that has to be equal to all these delta V over R1 plus delta V over R2 plus delta V over R3. If you divide everything by a delta V, since it shows up in every one of the terms in the right pair of right-hand sides, you end up getting that 1 over R equivalent in parallel is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. And so that is the take-home point for resistors in parallel. Now let us go ahead and consider
another set of short examples, this time of combinations of resistors. First, we want to know what is the equivalent resistance to a combination of three resistors in series, each with a resistance of 50 ohms. So R equivalent series is R1 plus R2 plus R3. So that's 50 ohms plus another 50 ohms plus another 50 ohms, or 150 ohms. Okay, that one is truly a simple example. It gets a little more complex if we put these in parallel, but again, you can use 1 over R equivalent in parallel is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. Since we have numbers to plug in for each of these, we have basically 1 over 50 ohms plus 1 over 50 ohms plus 1 over 50 ohms, which is 3 over 50 ohms, and so you can take reciprocals of both sides to get that the equivalent parallel resistance is 50 over 3 ohms, which is about 16.7 ohms, 16.6 .6 repeating. So notice, by the way, that when you put resistors in series, the implication is that the total resistance of the series must be greater than the greatest resistor's resistance. When you put them in parallel, the total resistance is less than the smallest equivalent resistance. If they're all identical, then you can multiply the series by the number of resistors, or if they're in parallel, you can divide the total the individual resistors resistance by the number of resistors that are in parallel. Alright, for our third of these examples, you have two resistors. One has 100 ohms, the other has 200 ohms. It's an ideal EMF, E equals 10.0 volts. It's ideal, so that also means that delta V for the battery is 10.0 volts. And the question is, what are the possible currents, I, and voltage drops, delta V, across each resistor? So there's two ways that you can combine a pair of resistors uh, with a battery. One is that you have a battery like this, and it goes through resistor R1. So here's R1. Then it goes through resistor R2, R2, and it goes back to the battery. This is the series combination, and so in this case, R equivalent is in series. It's R1 plus R2, and that gives us 100 plus 200, which is 300 ohms. The current, therefore, is equal for both of the two resistors. I1 is equal to I2 is equal to I. And so that's going to be equal to delta V over R, which is 10.0 volts divided by 300 ohms. So that gives us a total uh, current of about 33.3 milliamps. So we'll say 0 0.033 uh, three amps. The voltage drop across them, however, is not going to be equal. Instead, we use delta V1 is I1 times R1. So that's 0 0.0333 amps times 100 ohms or 3.33 volts. For number two, we or voltage drop across resistance two, we have I2 R2, which is 0 0.333 amps times 200 ohms. And so that's about 6.66 volts. So that 
if you add these two together, you get back to roughly 10 volts. What happens now if we put them in parallel instead? Then the combination might look something like this. Again, we have our battery. This time, however, the battery is connected to these two such that here is R1 and over here is R2. So they're in parallel with each other now. If that's the case, then delta V is the same for both of them. Delta V equals delta V1 equals delta V2. And so that gives us a total voltage drop of 10.0 amps. What about the current drawn by each one? Well, the current drawn by each one is I is equal to uh, delta V over R. So we have delta VI over RI. So this means that I1 can be obtained, should be a volt, not an amp. I1 can be obtained using delta V, which was 10.0 volts, divided by 100 ohms. And so that means that this thing is now drawing 0 0.10 0 amps. And I2 is equal to 10.0 volts divided by 200 ohms, which is 0 0.050 amps. And the total current drawn by both, I, should be I1 plus I2, or 0 0.15 amps. Notice that this is considerably more than what was drawn by the series combination above. So a parallel combination of resistors will always draw more current than the equivalent pair of resistors, the same pair of resistors, I should say, when they're placed in series. Parallel will draw more. Parallel will therefore also use more power. What happens if we have a combination of resistors which is more complex than the simplistic all of them are in series or all of them are in parallel. Well we can approach some slightly more complex combinations of resistors in the same way as what we approach the more complex combinations of capacitors. Basically we look at the combination and we try to find are there contradictions in stating that this resistor is in combination with this other one in such and such manner. So for example, we can say that, uh, let's say that this one is resistor R1, R2, R3, and R4. We can say that R1 is in series with R2, and we can say that R2 is in parallel with R3, we can say that R2 is in parallel with R4, excuse me, in series with R4. It's in series with R3 and in series with R4. R3 and R4 are in parallel with each other. They are also both in series with this one. It becomes a contradiction if we say R2 is in series with R1, R2 is in series with R4. So R2 is in series with R3 and R4. But R3 and R4 are not in series with each other. They are, in fact, in parallel. There is a sort of contradiction there if we s state all those like such. However, this is, in fact, in series with the combination of these. And it is really in series with each one of them. It's just in series with this parallel combination. Similarly, this is in series with both of these. This is in series with both of these. But these two are not in series with each other. They are, in fact, in parallel. There's another contradiction. So we have to break this up by saying, okay, it doesn't 
make any contradictions to just say these two are in series with each other, because they are. There's no contradiction implied by saying that these two are just in parallel with each other. They are. So we find the equivalent resistance for this pair, 12 ohms. We find the equivalent resistance for this pair. Turns out it's 2 ohms. Then these two are actually in series with, e with each other. So now we just combine them in series and you get 14.0 ohms. I previously used an analogy between current and water flowing through pipes. So this analogy can actually be extended a little more with today's lecture set. And basically what happens is the longer that the hose is that you're trying to push water through, the more work you have to do to get the same volume flow rate. So suppose that you are allowed a finite amount, and maybe I should say a fixed finite amount of work then a longer hose is going to produce less volume flow rate. Well, a longer hose is just equivalent to adding more resistors in series for, for uh, circuits. So by adding more, ser uh, more resistors in series, you're going to end up with less current, which is the charge flow rate, per unit of work, which is the voltage. On the other hand, the larger the hose, that is the bigger around the hose, the less work that you need to get the same volume of flow rate. So by similar analogy, if you have two hoses that branch off from one common pipe, like in a T connection, the water flow rate is going to be split between the two branches. Well, that means that the current has to be split between two branches from a junction in a given circuit. We've already talked about combining now capacitors in series or in parallel and resistors in series or in parallel. It turns out that there's another thing that we could be combining in series and parallel which is EMF sources, that is a battery for example. If you put a pair of batteries in series with each other then the total EMF is given as the sum of the individual EMFs. So this battery working on a charge would do 1.5 volts times the charge worth of work to move it from this terminal to this terminal. And this battery does the same thing in getting from this terminal to this terminal. Put the two together and you get a total work done of 1.5 volt plus 1.5 volt, that is 3.0 volts. If the terminals are opposed, like in this diagram where the plus is here and the minus here versus the plus here and the minus here, they're basically the two plus terminals are touching, if you will, the two minus terminals are on opposite sides, then you just subtract one EMF from the other. So the total uh, EMF for this is going to be 20 minus 12 or 8 volts. This by the way is how you set up a battery charger. This battery here is actually charging this battery here. Last but not least you can combine a pair of EMFs in parallel, a pair of batteries in parallel. And what this does is you, you usually, when you do this, you have the same EMF for both batteries. This is, for example, if you take apart your graphing calculator, you notice that there's several batteries placed side by side by side. They're basically being placed in parallel. What this means is that the total EMF supplied should be equal to the EMF of any one of those batteries because you have the same voltage drop across each branch of this. So why do you put them in parallel? Well what happens is that each one of these batteries supplies an equal share of the current and since the load out here has not changed and since the voltage of the pair is equal to the voltage for any one battery, it means the current itself, the total current, 
is the same. So you're drawing less current from each one of these batteries. In this case, each one is supplying half of the current. And since the current, uh, since the power of the battery is the voltage, or the EMF really, times the current, it means that the power used from each battery is half as much, and so each one should last about twice as long as if you just had one battery here. Uh, that's also, before I move on to Kirchhoff's laws, that's also why when you have a, for example, a graphing calculator, you can sometimes swap out one of the batteries. Let's say that you have four batteries in it, you run them through half the cycle, and then for some reason you decide to swap out one battery for another. The, the end result is that it still runs, and then the other batteries start dying off, and that one battery can still run the graphing calculator. Uh, you're still able to supply the correct voltage, you're still able to supply the correct amount of current, it's just that that one battery is now going to be drained a lot faster than the four that you initially had in the calculator would have been drained. So let's talk now about Kirchhoff's laws. I've kind of been hinting at them since uh, starting this lecture. Sometimes these are also called Kirchhoff's rules. What they are is a pair of rules. One says that the sum of currents entering any junction must equal the sum of currents leaving any junction. That's basically conservation of charge. And it's sometimes called the junction rule. The second rule or second law is that the sum of the potential differences across all elements around a given closed circuit loop must be zero and so this is sometimes called the loop rule and what they do is they allow us to analyze more complex circuits than what we've been doing you can see without going on to the more complex circuits that we've actually been using them already. That's how we were able to obtain the uh, equivalent resistance for both the series and the parallel combinations of resistors. To actually apply Kirchhoff's rules, there's a few steps that you take. First of all, you can assign symbols to all the junctions, the currents, the resistances, the EMF source, all of that. So for example, you have junction A, you have junction B, the voltage drop VB minus VA is the total potential difference between here and here is basically how much voltage drop do you have across this resistor. That must be equal to negative I times R, where R is the resistance and I is the current. And similarly, you can have a current going in the opposite direction through the junction, in which case the voltage drop has the opposite sign. So finally, you have EMFs, and the EMF is plus or minus depending upon what order the two terminals are in. And again, the voltage drop is, in this case, equal to either plus E or minus E. So the general rule that I like to obey is that you choose a direction. And that direction can either be counterclockwise or it could be clockwise. doesn't matter which. And you've chosen that direction, and that's the direction that you're going to transverse all of the rule, uh, excuse me, all of the loops. And so as you go around a loop, you look and you see, is the current going with you or against you as you go around that loop? And if it's going with you, then it's a plus. If it's going against you, it's a minus. You stick with this rule for all of your loops across your circuit. You're therefore able to add or subtract currents and add or subtract, uh, etc., resistors, and so on, as necessary to solve for your complex circuit.
So here then is the whole problem solving process written out for us. First of all, assign labels and symbols to all the unknown quantities. Do it for the known quantities too, but you need to do something for the unknown quantities. Second, assign a direction to all currents in each part of the circuit. That basically means, uh, so you're picking some direction that you're going to go around the loop. Then you're going to say, okay, is the current going to actually follow this direction or not? Don't worry if you pick incorrectly, you're just going to get a negative number that will work itself out as you do this. Then you apply Kirchhoff's laws. The junction rule is going to generate some equations. The loop rule is going to generate some equations. Once you have the equations that you've generated from this pair, you will have a system of equations. And so you can solve the system. And then at the end, you can check your answers by substituting whatever you get into the original set of equations.
let us now attempt a slightly longer example. Uh, this one uses a kind of complex looking circuit, if you will. So how do we approach this circuit? So we want to figure out what the total resistance of this circuit is. And one way that we could do that is to basically try to draw a circuit that has an equivalent configuration of resistors. All right, in order to solve this, there's really one simple approach that we can take. Uh, for one thing, remember that R1 equals R2 equals R3 equals R4 equals R5 equals R6 was given as just R, and each of these were 100 ohms as given. Um, but I have labeled all of them R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, and R6. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw an equivalent circuit to this. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to take some current off of this first battery. And we're going to call that current I1. And that current basically is going to enter junction C. And it has to split between these two branches. So this way will be current I2. And this way will be current I3. So I2 basically gets over to this junction. And since the current is basically just following the E field lines locally, in other words, it's going from high potential to low potential, this current will now basically come back down here into this branch as current I1 again. Uh, it becomes I1 when it recombines with all the other currents. So I3 makes it up to this branch. And again, it has two possible paths it can take. One is to go this way and one is to go this way. So we're going to call this I4. We're going to call this one I5. Note that I5 then also goes through 6. So these two end up recombining at this junction. And this guy only is going to go this way. This guy only is going to go this way. So how do we redraw this as an equivalent circuit over here? Well let's look at the path that we actually followed with the current and see what resistors we go through in turn. So the first resistor that we went through is resistor R1. There's no choice for the current here. It has to go through this first resistor R1 to get to any of the others. However, after going through R1, it basically then splits into two branches. This is at junction C. Branch number one has just the current, uh, just the resistor R2 in it. So here would be R2, and once it's gone through R2, it's allowed to basically come back down here and reconnect. The other side has R3 to it. So we'll draw in resistor R3. And then it gets to branch B, or to junction B, I should say. And at junction B, it splits again. So the split has to it one direction. There is R4. And once it goes through R4, it basically is allowed to come back down here. Um, actually, let's draw that a little differently just for convenience sake, because I'm going to make this right here be my junction A. If it does not go through R4, then it has to go through R5.
and then from R5 it has to continue through R6. Once it goes through R6, it basically can rejoin junction A. So here is our equivalent circuit as best as I can draw it. Notice that I'm basically just used Kirchhoff's law, specifically his junction rule, to construct this equivalent circuit. And in this equivalent circuit, we can see that there are basically a hierarchy of resistors, if you will. First up in this hierarchy is that these two are in series. And we'll say that these combine to give us uh, R, uh, let's call it R sub A. If I was going to redraw this, I would basically draw RA and R4 to be in parallel with each other. So RA and R4 are in parallel. So we'll call it RB. So 1 over RB is 1 over RA plus 1 over R4. Okay, it might be useful at this point, and RA, of course, is series combination, so RA is equal to R5 plus R6. So it might be useful at this point to redraw our diagram again. So this is the equivalent circuit, then, that you'd get by the time you get down to this RB guy. And you can see that, basically, you go through R1, you're at junction C, you can go through 2 or 3 and RB. So we're going to make another uh, resistor, which I'm going to call resistor RD, uh, excuse me, RC. So RC is RB plus R4. And then we can then combine that one with R2. And that's going to give us R, uh, let's call it 1 over RD is equal to 1 over RC plus 1 over R2. Okay, and you can see that then we have RD and R1 in series. So the actual equivalent resistance to all of this is going to just be R equivalent equals R1 plus RD. So at this point what has to happen is we basically need to work backwards through all of this stuff to get to the equivalent resistance. So how are we going to do that? Well, first step is to find RA. So let's get RA by doing this. RA is equal to R5 plus R6. That's 100 ohms plus another 100 ohms, which is 200 ohms. Okay, done. Now, next step is find RB. Well, to get RB, we're going to have to use the parallel resistors thing. So let's go ahead and move all this stuff up a little bit. Uh, you can see, of course, that RB 1 over RB is 1 over RA plus 1 over R4. So I'm going to move that up so I have a little more workspace. 1 over RB equals 1 over RA plus 1 over R4. Uh, <coughs> so that means that you have 1 over RB is equal to 1 over 200 ohms plus 1 over 100 ohms. This right here would be 0 0.005 inverse ohms. This right here is 0 0.01 inverse ohms. So we have 1 over RB is equal to 0 0.015 inverse ohms. And that means that RB must be about 66.7. So we'll call it 67 ohms. Okay. Uh, 
so the next step is to get RC. So RC is the series combination RB plus R3. So we have 67 ohms plus 100 ohms or 167 ohms. Now we can do RD. So RD we get by using 1 over RD equals 1 over RC plus 1 over R2. This is a 2 in case you're having trouble reading my handwriting. So that would be 1 over uh, 167 ohms plus 1 over 100 ohms. Got to throw all that into a calculator at this point to solve. In any case, 1 over 167 is 0 0.005988, so we'll call it 99 inverse ohms, and this again is 0 0.01 inverse ohms. So add those two together, and you're going to get 0 0.015988, and now divide 1 by that and what you end up getting is 62.54 ohms. So RD is 62.54 ohms, which maybe gets rounded to 63 ohms. And so last but not least, we need to figure out what is the equivalent resistance. So to do that, we use R equivalent equals R1 plus RD, so that's 63 plus 100, that's 163 ohms. So now we found the equivalent resistance to all of these together. For, what's that, for what it's worth, if we did this symbolically, what we would have come up with is R equivalent is, uh, I guess it was 13 eighths of R. And so then if you plug in that 100 ohms that we started off with, you end up with 162.5 ohms, which we would have rounded to 163 ohms. Okay, so we've got the equivalent resistance, or the total resistance of the circuit. The other things that we're supposed to do here are figure out what the current is and then also figure out what the potential difference between points A and B and points A and C are. So how are we going to do that? Well, maybe it's worth rewriting over here what each of these equivalent resistances are, just to have as sort of uh, show work, if you will. Uh, so we have our A was 200 ohms. RB was 67 ohms, RC was 167 ohms, RD was 63 ohms, and R equivalent was 163 ohms. Okay. All right, so if we want to figure out what the voltage drop is from point A to B or from point A to C, we can again make use of Kirchhoff's laws and again we can draw some equivalent circuits. Um, however, it might be useful once again to remember what the currents were doing. This was current I1 and it splits into two branches here and here. I3 I2 splits here into two branches, I4, and this one was I5. If we were to draw this resistor, or this uh, circuit, as a parallel... <coughs> if we were to draw this circuit using the equivalent resistance, we could draw it like this, where here's the negative and the positive terminal, and it's hooked up to a single resistor, REQ. This again is 10.0 volts.
So what this lets us do is it lets us figure out what is the total current drawn by the entire circuit. So I is equal to delta V over R equivalent. Maybe we could call this I total. That would be 10.0 volts divided by 163 ohms. And so that's going to give us a total uh, current of 0 0.06 one three amps so that's the total current drawn by everything but remember that this right here was really equivalent to another circuit that looked like this so here is R1 and it's just in series with the RD What that means is, because these two are in series, according to the junction rule, if you will, that this total current is also the current drawn by both RD and R1. So if we wanted to get delta V1, we would use I1 R1, and that's actually just going to be equal to I total times R1 which is 0 0.0613 amps times 100 ohms. So delta V1, the voltage drop across just this, is going to be 6.13 amps. We've now found how much voltage drops across this one resistor. Okay, well, that means, according to Kirchhoff's other law, the, the voltage law that you know we're allowed to have delta V is delta V1 plus delta VD and so delta VD is equal to delta V minus delta V1 which is 10.0 volts minus 6.13 this should be volts not amps and so that would be 3.87 volts. But what is delta VD actually showing us? Well, we could redraw VD because this and this are equivalent to points C and point A. So delta VD is actually the voltage drop between A and C. So delta V for A and C is 3.87 volts. That's one of the things we were looking for. Okay, the other thing that we were looking for here was how much uh, is the voltage drop between points C and B? Well, to get from C to B, what do we have to do? Uh, remember that RD was basically equivalent to uh, doing a parallel branch, one of which had on it R3, uh, excuse me, one of which had on it R2 and the other of which had on it RC. But we've already determined, because these are points A and C on this, uh, we've already basically determined that the voltage drop across all this is 3.87 volts. So that means that there's a voltage drop of 3.87 across RC. Coincidentally, that also means that we can get what the current is here, because it's got to be this voltage over this resistance. So I2 would be 3.87 volts divided by 100 ohms, 
or 0 0.0387 amps. Be that as it may, the voltage drop across all of RC was also 3.87 volts. So that means that I sub C must be 3.87 volts divided by R sub C, which is 167 ohms. So that means that I sub C is actually going to be equal to 0.0232 amps. That's going to be the current flowing through IC. So what was IC equivalent to? Well, coming back over here, IC was equivalent to R3 in series with this. R uh, basically B, which was these two in parallel with this one. Remember that RC is equivalent, if you look up here, it's 167 ohms, it's equivalent to the series combination of, on the one hand, R sub B, and on the other hand, everything that R sub B was in series with. So what was R sub B? Well, R sub B was the parallel of R sub A, these two, with R4. So this is all in series with R3. So we need to put an R3 in right here. Now notice that R3 straddles the points between, or connects the points between B and C. So this is point, let's say, B, and this is point C, B and C. So the voltage drop, delta V3, is also equivalent to VBC. The current we've already solved for down here is 0.232 amps. That's the same current that's got to be flowing through R3. So this is also equal to I3. This voltage then, delta VBC or delta V3, must be I3 times R3. That's Ohm's law again. And so that's 100 ohms, because this is 100 ohms, times 0.0232 amps. In other words, delta V B C is actually 2.32 volts. So now we've actually solved for the two voltage drops that we were asked for. And while we're at it, we've basically solved for most of the currents that we're interested in. We've solved for this current, this current, and this current. There's uh, basically two currents that we could still solve for but it's just a continuation of this process that we've been going through. Namely, now we have the voltage drop across RB. It's got to be this current times this voltage, or this resistance, so 67 times 0 0.0232. That, by the way, is going to give us uh, delta V sub RB, or delta VB, uh, it's going to actually give us 1.55 volts for what that's worth. Well, that 1.55 volts is the same drop across R4 and the same drop across the combination R5 and R6. So I4 must be this divided by 100 ohms. So basically I4 is equal to 0 0.0155 amps. And at this point, we basically only have to solve for I5, and I5 comes from figuring out what this voltage drop is. Again, it's the same voltage drop for these as it is for this. So it's again 1.55, but now divided by 2, because there's 200 ohms. Uh, so 1.55 divided by 2. And so I5 must be about... 0 0.00775 amps.
So now we've actually solved for all the currents in this problem. Okay, so the process that I used to do all this, to recap, is that I started with this circuit and I asked where are the currents going to go in this circuit? Where do they split? In other words, where are the junctions? And so I redrew an equivalent circuit using these junctions. And as I redrew the circuit, I ended up with something that could be more easily solved because I had these in series and then that was in parallel with this and then all of that was in series with this and then all of that was in parallel with this and all of that was in parallel with this. <laughs> so basically I just worked from this combination out to the whole combination. Having done that I then went back through, figured out what the voltage drops must be by alternating between figuring out what's the voltage drop and so what's the current, what's the current, and so what's the voltage drop. So it's kind of an iterative process. Notice that in that previous example, although I kind of used Kirchhoff's rules, I didn't explicitly use them algebraically by having to set up currents and figure out what direction each current was in a given loop. So I wanted to show a different example and this diagram I also have taken from Giancali and you can see that this is not something that I'm going to be able to quickly and easily draw an equivalent diagram for. We're going to have to apply Kirchhoff's rules a little more explicitly to solve for this circuit. So what we want to do is figure out what's the total resistance of this entire circuit, both in terms of R and then again in terms of if R is 100 ohms and we have the EMF, can we figure out not only what's the equivalent total resistance, but also how much current is flowing through this battery, uh, through this circuit. Okay, we can see that this is going to be a little more difficult to try to break up into equivalent circuits. Uh, why do we see that? Well, our, this one, this one, and this one are all clearly in series with each other. This is clearly in parallel with both of these. This is clearly in parallel with both of these. This and this are clearly not in series. This is not just in series with this. There's, there's sort of no first step for breaking it up. So we've got to go actually to Kirchhoff's laws to do this. So how we're going to solve using Kirchhoff's laws is that we're going to go ahead and assign some currents. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to assign a current that I'm going to call I that comes out of this battery. The battery, by the way, had a voltage delta V is equal to the EMF. All right, so this current I enters into this junction and can split in two. One part goes here, we'll call it I number one. One part goes here, we'll call it I number two. Then in this junction, we get another split. I number three goes this way. I number four goes this way. Then in this junction we get I5 which is the combination of four plus in this case one. And then when we get back to this junction everything else has to combine back to regular I. So what is it that the Kirchhoff's uh, junction rules are going to give us. Uh, first of all, it might be helpful here to also label the junctions. So we can call it junction A, junction B, junction C, and junction D. Um, and let's look at the first three of these junctions and what happens. So for junction A, we have basically that the current entering the junction is I. The current leaving it is I1 plus I2. For junction B, 
the current entering is I2. The current leaving must be I3 plus I4. In junction C, the current entering is, and again we can draw I1 coming all the way around like this, we have junction I1 and junction I4 entering. So I1 plus I4 enter it, I5 is leaving it. In junction D, for what it's worth, we have I5 entering it along with I3. And so I3 plus I5 must also equal I. Okay, what about voltages? Voltage drop across all the elements in a complete closed loop must be zero. So what are the complete closed loops? Well, one closed loop is this one right here. So we have a voltage drop across this resistor, this resistor, and this resistor. Uh, so we can call this loop, I don't know, loop, maybe this is loop, uh, call it loop one, loop two, and loop three. So for loop number one, we have the EMF. So we have zero is equal to the EMF plus the current that we have I. Uh, and in fact, I'm actually going to do minus I. So I'm going to choose this direction to be the negative direction, if you will. So we have minus I times R. And then we also have a current through this R. So we have another minus I3 uh, times R. Uh, this one right here should be actually I2 because that's how much current we have through this particular resistor. Loop number two, we have a current I1, which is passing through one resistor. We have a current number uh, I2 passing through the second resistor. So actually maybe you should be consistent here, call it minus I2R. This is minus I1R. And then last but not least, we have I4 also passing through R. So looking again at which direction each of these currents is going in, if we take the uh, counterclockwise direction to be positive, then this one right here is the positive. These two are the negatives. And finally, for number three, loop three is this loop. We have I3 going in the counterclockwise direction. So that's a minus I3 times R. We have I4 going in the clockwise direction. So that's plus I4 times R. And we have I5 going in the clockwise direction, so plus I5 times R. So this gives us our system of equations, uh, basically equations one through three and A through D. Although if you count how many unknowns there are here, we're basically noting that we know the value of R and we know the value of epsilon. So this right here is 10.0 volts eventually, and this right here is 100 ohms eventually. So what are the unknowns? We don't know this, so that's one. We don't know this, we don't know this, we don't know this, we don't know this, and that pretty well does it. So we basically don't know any of the currents, so we don't know current number five. What I have here is a 
system of seven equations, six unknowns. Hypothetically speaking, all of these equations should be in agreement with each other, and so I should be able to use whichever set I want. But it turns out that not all choices are necessarily equal. Um, case in point, Giancali in their solution to this does the set that's in black. Just for fun, I'm going to see where the set in gray leads us. And I suspect that it's going to lead us to something where we find that we've duplicated an equation. So let's start off by noting that there's an I here, there's an I here. So the low hanging fruit, as it were, is to set the two of them equal to each other to get rid of an I. So I1 plus I3, that would be these two terms, is equal to I5 plus I3. Okay, now I see over here that there's an I5 alone in this equation. So let's solve this for I5. Um, I5 is equal to I1 plus I2 minus I3. So now we can set that equal to this. So we have I1 plus I2 minus I3 is equal to I1 plus I4. And of course there's an I1 on both sides so we can eliminate that. Now therefore we have I4 is equal to I2 minus I3. Notice that this was AD. We now combined it with C, so this would be like AD combined with C. But notice that I4 equals I2 minus I3 can be rewritten as I2 equals I3 plus I4. And that is equation B over here. So I've just duplicated one of the equations that I already had. What that means is that by using the set that I've boxed, I really effectively have five equations and six unknowns. I can't finish the solution with that. So not all sets of these equations, not all combinations of six equations are going to be equivalent. Because if you work through with the stuff that's in black, you will end up not duplicating an equation and you will end up coming up with a solution at the end. Uh, note that the basic solution is going to be that the current I has to be the voltage divided by the equivalent resistance for this combination. And so you're basically going to solve for this equivalent resistance in terms of the resistance R. I don't want to give away too much here because at this point it really is an algebra problem. Just work through this system of six equations and six unknowns. It's a lot of algebra. What you're going to end up with though is that R equivalent is basically just equal to R for this entire combination. And so to go back to the example that I had to begin with, I asked if R is equal to 100 ohms, then, and epsilon is equal to 10.0 volts, what is the current draw? Well, we can see that I must be equal to uh, 10 over 100, or 0 0.100 amps. From there, we can try to figure out how much is going to each of these points. Uh, for example, I2R minus I3R has to be this epsilon, and I2 is I3 plus I4, and so on and so forth. You can basically work your way back through and figure out just how much current there is in each one of these uh, branches. Basically what you're going to find is that I1 is equal to half of I, so 0 0.0500 amps. Uh, 
And since I1 plus I2 is I, that also means that I2 is equal to this. And so on and so forth. So that's it for this example. We had two pretty long, long examples. And there aren't a lot of new terms that I've introduced here. In fact, most of the stuff that I've introduced in this lecture is material that is, in a sense, obtained from the previous set of lectures. The concept of EMF as a charge pump and as the maximum possible terminal voltage of a battery is new to this lecture. Um, also relating it to the terminal voltage of a battery where EMF is the terminal voltage plus the current drawn times the internal resistance. That's a new thing. Uh, the total current coming out of a battery is the EMF divided by the sum of the load resistance and the internal resistance. The ohmic power from a battery is I times EMF, the current times the EMF. And so logically that means that it must be I times I times R plus R because if you multiply both sides of this by R plus R you get I times R plus R. So you have I squared R plus R. And then the other thing that I introduced was how to combine resistors in series and in parallel, although the analysis for figuring out what to do is kind of sort of similar to the analysis that we used for capacitors. So in series of resistors add resistances. In parallel, it's the reciprocals that are added together to make the equivalent. Note that this is the opposite of what happens with a capacitor. With a capacitor, when they were in series, you had to add the reciprocals to get the reciprocal of the equivalent. And when they were in parallel, you just added them together. Uh, this actually has to do with the fact that with a capacitor, the capacitance is proportional for a parallel plate capacitor. It's proportional to area divided by length. For a resistor, the resistance is, compar is, a, is a comparable to length over area. That is, the resistance scales with length divided by area as opposed to the capacitance which scales with area divided by length. Since those are reciprocals, you get sort of a flipping of this, uh, how to find the equivalence for series and for parallel. The last thing that I introduced was what to do with Kirchhoff's laws and that basically there is the junction rule and there is the loop rule. Junction rule pertains to conservation of charge. It says that all the current entering a junction must also leave the junction and vice versa. And conservation of energy basically says that as you go around an entire loop of a circuit, the total sum of all the voltage drops should be zero. So that's it for today's part of this lecture. This was the part that introduced DC circuits. There was quite a bit of material in this part all in all. The next set of lectures, or the next part of this set of lectures I should say, is actually going to be about applications of DC current, uh, excuse me, of DC circuits. So we're going to look at, um, first of all, what happens if you put a capacitor together with a resistor. And then we're going to kind of go from there. We're going to talk a little bit about nerve cells. And we're going to talk a little bit about applications of an RC circuit and so on. So that's all that I've got for today's lecture. I hope that you found this helpful and thanks for watching.